Okay, our last speaker. And the birthday boy will be introduced by his longtime friend and colleague, Noam Chomsky. Well, I learned a long time ago that the best introductions are the shortest ones, so I'll live up to that precept. Uh, I've had the uh, rare privilege of being able to work with Morris pretty closely uh, ever since we were graduate students uh, down the river over 60 years ago. Uh, lots of opportunities for discussion and uh, shared offices, uh, drives home, uh, many other occasions. And it's been a remarkable experience in many ways. Uh, one unique way, uh, namely it was an opportunity, which is, is indeed rare, to watch a new discipline emerge, modern phonology, uh, under Morris's uh, initiative and guidance. and. Uh, so like the rest of you, I'm eager to hear his latest thoughts on uh, how to carry this project that he largely created uh, forward to the next stage. I'll assume here that the knowledge that speakers have of the words of their language consists in part of a branching tree of the kind illustrated in one in your handout. You, you can't follow this speech without the handout, so. <laughs> and there should be plenty of handouts around, okay? Uh, so for example, in one, you, I, I've, I've taken the Latin word portaver, portaver, portaverimus, uh, which is written down on the bottom, which means we will have carried. And I've given the syntactic structure or the, the, the different kind of components that it has. It has a verb stem and it has an inflection and I have suggested a syntactic structure for that particular inflection. Now, uh, on the bottom line of one, I've shown the phonetic exponents of the five morphemes that make up the ver verb form. And in the line directly above, I have listed their grammatical categories. That is, verb, stem, theme, etc. It is to be noted that not every phoneme in the bottom line of one is part of the syntactic uh, structure of uh, syntactic and semantic structure of the sen a sentence. For example, I think that the V preceding the perfect morpheme, which is E, uh, and the R preceding the future morpheme, uh, they're just phonetic material. They are not part of the uh, morphological structure. On the bottom line of, uh, okay, each phoneme uh, in, my, uh, on, uh, in my view, is a complex of phonetic features as illustrated in two. Uh, now, uh, the f uh, 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 um, sorry, with the six vowels that appear in underlying representations <coughs> of Latin words. The six vowel in two, the six vowel in two, represented here by a capital I, uh, is the theme vowel that appears in the class of verto vertimus in Latin, which means a uh, uh, turn. Uh, the phonemes are not the ultimate constituents of words, uh, of each word. Uh, sorry, they are not the ultimate constituents of the words and the morphemes. Each phoneme itself is a complex of phonetic features as illustrated in two. In uh, <clears throat> three, I've shown the example of, uh, an, uh, of an inflected form uh, of the Latin verb, in particular, the present tense form of, of uh, the various present tense forms of the Latin verb. Now, each of the 
first uh, plural form in three is composed of three pieces, to the, on the first line of three. It's composed of three pieces, a verb, a verb stem, a theme, and the inflection. In the examples in, uh, in three, there are three long theme vowels, A, A, E, and one short theme vowel, short E. In fact, the last two stems in three, uh, in, in, uh, in three uh, are, are, must be distinct, because if you compare, for example, vertimus, which is the last one, and you get verto, but capimus, you get capio. So the theme vowel, the vowel following the verb stem in capio is preserved, but in verto is deleted. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> so, so they, uh, they cannot be the same vowel, and my suggestion is that this vowel is uh, a, uh, is a capital I, which uh, uh, has the features of the capital I, namely that it's a plus uh, high minus, uh, uh, plus high minus, sorry, plus high minus round uh, plus back vowel. So it's ui, it's like the Russian ui. Now such a vowel does not appear, of course, on uh, uh, in Latin is never pronounced, and I account for this fact by uh, uh, saying that uh, the, a, a, a rule such as 4b applies in Latin, and that turns any u that makes it to the surface just before uh, it, it, it gets there into e. So it merges it with into e. But uh, earlier in the representation, in the derivation, we have two distinct vowels. We have a capital I and a regular lowercase i. Now, the uh, di difference between these two is that the capital I, that in, in Latin, uh, as I, uh, as vowels are, some vowels are subject to deletion in prevocalic position. So, for example, we say portamus, but porto. And we say, uh, and similarly, we say vertimus, but verto. So both this e, the second e and the vowel a are deleted in this position. Well, it's very convenient because a is a plus back unrounded vowel and so is capital e, uh, the capital E. And so both of them have the feature plus back minus round, and then we can, uh, uh, as I noted already, uh, uh, say that they are subject to the deletion rule, which is for, uh, in your handout as 4A. Now, uh, it's crucial to note that the two rules 4a and 4b generate the correct output only if the rules are applied in the order that 4a precedes 4b. If 4b were to apply before 4a, it would turn every underlying capital I into, uh, into E, in, sorry, if 4a were to apply before 4, uh, 4b, it would turn every capital I into E, into e. and that's of course uh, in, in incorrect. It would therefore there would be no capital I's left for rule 4b to apply to delete uh, to, uh, to delete, and so the conclusion from this is that you have to apply rule 4b uh, after rule. 4, 4a. If you applied it, if you applied 4b before 4a, uh, the, uh, rule 4b, uh, rule 4a could not uh, properly operate. Now, the important thing, uh, the moral of this to 
uh, uh, the, to remember is, is what's stated in five. That is, I assume that phonological rules applied in order, and the order is crucial. So the fact that I've given two rules now, namely 4A and 4B, and that they apply in the order 4A and 4B is absolutely as crucial as just stating the rule. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I want to say something about the finite forms of Latin verbs. Now, uh, an aspect of the morphology that Latin shares with many languages is that unmarked morphological categories are often signaled by the absence uh, of phonetic markers. This is illustrated in six, for example, with the different tense forms of the Latin verb. So if you look in the first column, there uh, we, we have portamus, and, uh, in, uh, portamus, but in the second column you have portabamus and portabimus. So this ba b doesn't appear in the first column. It's just simply absent. I mean, we can get the first column by deleting ba and b in, in uh, column two and three. And similarly, we can get uh, porta verimus and porta veramus in the bottom line by deleting uh, these, these very much, uh, sorry, we can get portavimus, which is the first unmarked, uh, the unmarked perfect form in six on, on the left by deleting ra and re in uh, Porta Veramus and Porta Veramus in, in, in the other two forms in six. The basic for the uh, abstract form of the Latin verb is given seven, and uh, of, the fi of the finite, the inflected Latin verb. There are other for additional forms, but I'm just limiting myself here to a, a subset of the finite forms, those that are inflected. So, you know, I or you or something like that. So it, it consists of a verb stem, a theme, an optional perfect marker, and an optional future marker, alpha future marker, and an ob obligatory auger. So the formula for the Latin verb form is basically that in seven. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, these abstract elements, which are part of the finite form, are supplied phonetic material by rules of vocabulary insertion of the kind shown in eight. So for example, the first singular is O in, in the present tense, or the, the second singular is S, and, and so on, down as, as shown in, in eight. And there are actual examples if you look at them. Uh, you can read down the list. The theme, the this, this verb stem undergoes changes in different tense forms. The theme vowels are shown in uh, 9a, 9b. The theme vowels follow the stem. There's uh, audire has a long e, capere uh, has a short e, and vetere has a, sh a short uh, uh, cap i. And after these three vowels, we insert, the theme gets changed and an a is inserted. And similarly, it is also inserted in the future forms uh, as shown uh, in, in, uh, on the right-hand side in 9b. No insertion applies uh, after minus high vowels. So we say portabamus, portabimus, uh, delebamus, uh, delebimus, and etc. The phonetic exponents of the alpha future morpheme, and this is now the next one, which is discussed in 10. Uh, uh, are supplied by vocabulary insertion rules 10 in, in 10. And notice that the minus future, that is the 
which is the past tense morpheme, is ah. But the plus future morpheme is uh, capital I. In the environment of, pl uh, minus high, uh, uh, of, a of a minus high vowel, uh, stem vowel. Uh, elsewhere, in the, when, when the stem vowel is not minus high, it's deleted. This is something which is rarely noticed in Latin grammars. And uh, in, in fact, uh, every Latin grammar I've, I looked, uh, uh, none of the Latin grammars says it. It's there, of course, they print the correct forms, but uh, it, it's never stated as a principle of how to form these, these forms. <clears throat> the consonants B and S, if you look at now in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the examples in, in C, I have assumed that the past tense is, is, uh, is an A uh, morpheme, and that the future is capital I. But notice that <clears throat> uh, normal, the, the, uh, and, and it is preceded by a consonant, which is uh, uh, the car which happens to be B. Uh, so uh, as, as, as illustrated in the examples in uh, 10C. Now, uh, the, the consonants B or S are inserted before the future morpheme by uh, uh, rule 11. I mean, a, so in other words, I assume that the uh, future is uh, the, um, sorry, that the alpha future morpheme is a single vowel, which is very different from the way standard grammars do, where, uh, which assume that the uh, uh, future morpheme is uh, the alpha future morpheme it has a consonant. It's either B or C, uh, Ra or something like that. Now, um, <clears throat> the uh, this uh, uh, this alternative idea, uh, namely that the consonant that the alpha morpheme future is. Uh, has a structure CV rather than V, uh, uh, seems to me to be incorrect. In the present account, the insertion of the consonant before the alpha future morpheme is due to the rule 11A and B, which is, are shown in uh, 13. So, for example, we say auximus, if you look in the left column, we, uh, this, these are the perfect forms. We say vertimus or capimus, uh, 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 capimus, we say auximus, vinximus, scripsimus, we say sequimus, manuimus, or portavimus, delevimus. Now, the important, the, the interesting thing about this, uh, uh, the affixation of the perfect suffix is wh uh, whether it deletes the theme vowel or preserves the theme vowel. So in, uh, let's say in auximus, the, the, the theme vowel is augem, uh, uh, it's augemus, so it must be A. Or in vinximus, the, uh, uh, the uh, theme vowel is E, so it should have been vincissimus but, uh, or vincirimus. But uh, actually, it goes right onto the stem. So the theme vowel is deleted. The S goes directly on this theme. Now, notice that this is different from the, the, the other ver, uh, perfect morpheme, which is V, where you get, on the one hand, portavimus, uh, delevimus, divimus, where the uh, theme vowel is preserved, and on the other hand, you get sequimus, monuimus, aper, aperuimus, which are um, whereas you might expect secavimus or monevimus or aperivimus, none of these occur because the same vowel is systematically deleted in the perfect uh, with, with these with these stems. I mean, this is something again, whether the same vowel is preserved or deleted, 
uh, this is something that the standard grammars don't seem to, they list the forms, but they don't ever tell you what, why, why they are different. I've illustrated this fact in 14. Notice that so the first form, vertimus, the underlying theme would be cap capital I, and, but this capital I is followed by the perfect, which then, uh, since Latin is subject to deletion, to the uh, deletion rule 4a, this gets deleted, so the output is vertimus. Sim uh, 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 now, in the, the next auction is underlying is augemus, so it has a theme A. We add to the, uh, the uh, special morpheme S here, which gets, uh, which happens to delete uh, and delete the theme vowel, uh, and we get auximus. In secavimus, instead of getting secavimus, we get sequimus. But let notice that in portavimus, uh, in, uh, in portare, we don't uh, get portuimus, we get portavimus. So whether the theme vowel is deleted uh, right. depends, before the u suffix, depends on, st uh, I mean, it's a morphological fact, which uh, in Latin, uh, which uh, uh, Latin grammars give you different lists of stems which are subject that the, uh, uh, what, uh, what stems are the subject to deletion which, uh, of theme vowel or what subjects are not deletion to theme vowel. Uh, uh, it was noted above uh, that the theme vowel is, lead, uh, uh, the theme vowel is deleted before the suffix s in the perfect and before the perfect uh, uh, suffix e. Uh, but uh, or, or oftentimes, uh, and, and this is illustrated in great detail if you uh, look at it in uh, the handout uh, under two in, uh, in, in the, the, which, the 16, uh, 16C2. Uh, Roman two. Uh, uh, then, uh, okay. Now, uh, to sum up what I try to present here is that there are uh, basically three rules of vocab, uh, four rules of vocabulary insertion. Uh, this is shown in seventeen, uh, namely insert. Uh, exponents of uh, uh, the person endings of the verb, insert the exponents of the alpha future morpheme, insert long A after uh, plus high themes, and insert S and B before the alpha future morpheme. And then there are two phonological rules which say delete the theme vowel, the, namely 4A and 4B, which says delete the theme vowel in pre-vocalic position and for it front uh, minus round plus high vowels. Okay. And this is uh, sort of an extension of what is normally found in Latin grammars, but it's always ex uh, assumed in Latin grammars that there will be, that, the, the, that you will know that some forms are, have no explanation. Well, here I've given explanation for all the forms that are uh, actually uh, sh shown in Latin grammar books. Uh, I, I conclude by, make, uh, by noting an interesting difference between the finite forms of Latin on the one hand and some other Indo-European languages and those of German. Now, interesting in, in Latin, we all have, uh, even if you don't know no, no, no Latin, you know the words that you will say. You say, I don't know, aud, aud, audive ramos, we, we heard. And, and so uh, what, uh, there is a stem, there's some various suffixes, and mus is the agar morphe, you know. Now, interesting that it, uh, when you look in German, 
uh, it, uh, it's like in, in 18. Notice that you have, uh, um, uh, you say, das, das du nach Sibirien verschickt worden sein konntest. Now, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the translation is that you might have been exiled to Siberia. Uh, 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 now, verschickt is, the, uh, uh, is exiled. Worden is the, pers p the passive. Uh, sein uh, is an, uh, 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 the perfect. And contest is the um, uh, modal. And te test is pre the tense and agar morpheme, as, as shown in 19. Now, this is the order here, on, uh, shown on bottom of 18, is identical with basically with that uh, that you can find in Latin. <coughs> so, for, so we say porta ver verimus. As, as shown in 19 with this verb is first, the perfect comes next, the few, minus future next, and the other last. Um, it can readily be imagined that the sequence of constituents in 18 resulted from the introduction into Germanic of a restriction that limited the, the Array, long array of suffixes to one per, per verb. And so, uh, and, and in order to ha deal with this long array of suffixes, auxiliary verbs were inserted before every one of the suffixes, of, of the mor uh, suffix morphemes. So you had, a, uh, you had a long sequence of suffixes like that in, uh, 19, and now bef before each one of those on the bottom line, you inserted a, 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 a verb of its own. So now you, uh, and, and, that, uh, and that, that was the basic, uh, the basic change. Now, what I, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, and this happened in all the Germanic languages to my knowledge. I do not know, uh, 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 and this must have happened, uh, it must have been a common Germanic feature because uh, all Germanic languages have that. Now, <clears throat> now in the, it's interesting that the order in English, so no, notice that the order in, Latin, in German uh, and in Latin is verb first, and agar last, you know, and, I, and all the other things are in between. Now, uh, interestingly, in English, as you can see, as I've done it, as shown it in 20, the order is the opposite. You say that you could have been exiled to Siberia. So, exiled is last, and past tense could is first. Yeah. So uh, and uh, and so the and then the con now we also know that in English, uh, the English is subject to affix hopping, and so that the underlying order of morphemes must have been that of twenty one. I I will uh, conclude very briefly with a uh, with a review of the main steps in the evolution of the auxiliary verb in Germanic from its uh, Indo-European antecedent. In the initial uh, Indo-European stages, it, the, inflected, the inflection of the verb involved suffixation exclusively, as I have already remarked. In this pre-Germanic stage, every finite verb began with a stem and ended with an agromorphium, as shown in 19 above. The innovation introduced in the Germanic languages and had the effect of restricting to one the number of suffixes that the verb could take. This restriction was implemented by the introduction into Germanic of a set of transformations that inserted a different auxiliary verb before each of the suffixes of the main verb. This transformation converted a verb followed by a, 
a long sequence of suffixes, such as the one in 19, in, into a sequence of separate verbs, where each verb consisted of a single stem and, and had a plus a suffix. Uh, the major innovation in English involved a reversal of the order of the constituents of the verb. As shown in 21, the English verb begins with the agri-morpheme and followed by the modal, which in turn is followed by perf which perfect and, and its auxiliary have, and the progressive and its auxiliary be, and, uh, and finally the passive and its auxiliary be, so I could have been exiled. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, when comparing 19 with 21, it is to be noted that the reversal of the, oh, in 21 affects the abstract morphemes, but it does not uh, affect the phonemes that represent the distinct morphemes. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. Uh, this, um, oh, my name is Alex Jaker, uh, Alaska Native Language Center. Uh, my question is, uh, the sixth vowel you propose, the, um, the, the, the cent for, for Latin, yes, the central uh, vowel, does it have a consistent historical source? D does it always come from, for example, a certain laryngeal, or uh, what is the historical source of that in general? I, I, I really do not know. I, uh, I was wondering if, any, if there's any Germanist here who can suggest something, because the books are, don't say anything about it. And I, I, it's apparently limited to only these uh, tense morphemes and so on. It's, it's rather limited in distribution. There are no, uh, you know, lexical items that have this part out that I could find. John McCarthy, UMass Amherst. Uh, this isn't perhaps so much a question, or maybe it's a question for everyone. Um, um, in the sound pattern of English, there was a, a real effort to incorporate a lot of English alternations into the phonology. But there was always a residue, um, a residue in the, that was put into the readjustment rule component. Okay. And in the, the case here of your analysis of Latin, you have um, some processes that are essentially readjustment rules. Uh, they apply only to lists of verbs, you know, specific listed verbs. Yeah. And then you have the, right, and then you have the general analysis of the uh, difference between the third, the third conjugation I stems and the regular third, de third declension. And I guess the question that always arises in these cases is, where do we draw the line? So where do we draw the line? So um, should there be a, a, an abstract vowel, like the, the, the barred I, or should we have readjustment rules for that case as well? And I think it's a, a question we always have to struggle with. As you can see, my, my idea is that you do have a, a, an abstract vowel because uh, I, uh, I believe that that's uh, uh, less of a burden on the memory. You know, if you, that is, uh, otherwise, you've got to memorize long lists of verbs that are subject, basically. But I really don't know whether that's. Uh, you know, I, ha I have a very strong argument for it. But it's something that, you know, in the next, in a few years, in the future, needs to be very studied and figured out. Norman Richards from MIT. I have a question about the formulation of the one subject. 
I, I have a question about uh, how to formulate the one suffix per Germanic verb rule. Um, so the last German verb in 18 actually has two suffixes on it, right? It has a past tense suffix and then it has an agreement suffix. Is the idea that the agreement suffix doesn't count for that? Or? There's a rule, that, a word formation rule, which just spells out suffixes, but in, uh, there's a transformation which inserts auxiliary verbs in front of each of those uh, 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 suffixes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, these auxiliary verbs uh, form a separate word, mm -hmm. and, and word boundary goes in there. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way. So the uh, long vowels, which are traditionally called theme yeah, vowels, yes. to the exclusion of the short ones, um, are the equivalent to the exclusion of the short ones of the yeah, short yeah. e. There's five in line. Yeah. So right? so so the, the the my only point was that the short yeah. items that are that you call theme vowels. They have the systematic property of disappearing before every perfect suffix. Yes. Uh, uh, whereas the long vowels, they typically do remain in the perfect. Right. Suggesting that those are the only per, uh, theme vowels. So you have a theme vowel, uh, uh, as in, you know, portare or something like this, right? And you have theme vowel A as in delere, and you have theme vowel e as in audire, and you have theme vowel short e as in uh, 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 copio, copimus, and, and it's copere because there's a special rule which takes short e to, uh, to a. And there, uh, there's short i, cap i, uh, in uh, that. in position before, which I have suggested has the features plus high, uh, plus back, minus round. That is, it has the same features as the vowel in Russian, in such a word as, say, mula, meaning soap. I mean, just to give, make it. So this, this is that. This is an abstract in Latin. This vowel never surfaces because if it's, it's either deleted in pre-vocalic position or it is subject to rule four B and it becomes E. I mean, that that's what's my account. So I'm proposing that there is an extra vowel, a sixth vowel of Latin, and this vowel e easily deletes. Or when it doesn't believe it comes in. Okay, that's that. Yeah, I think Maurice, you should point out. Uh, talk microphone. in the microphone, I yeah, can't. Okay. I should point out the, the imperfect and the future. You should point out to the imperfect and the futures because they are, the two E's behave differently. In case of the perfect, audiebam and audiemus. Oh, and okay. that was this important part of your argument. Yes. Divinity of the history of... Uh, well, because what the, yeah. the, the E... The, 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 what happened in the perfect. I, the, the part, important part of your argument is not what happened in the present, yeah. but what happens in the imperfect yes. of uh, vertebamus with a long E in case of audiebamus. Yes. And audiemus 
and Vertemus. Correct. Because they, they are the pattern together. Right. So it seems to be that in case of Vertemus, there is right. something like a vowel which is high but does not surface. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you.